Can anybody hear me now? Ah, <laughs> right. So I'll start again then. You know. Um, so welcome, welcome to this session today on taking a look at uh, Pedal Linux and how we can perfect pe perfect Pedal Linux. It's going to take us about an hour, maybe two hours, uh, to get through everything. Like I say, a couple of uh housekeeping announcements before we before we go on if you get any questions or anything just please put it in the uh in the chat in the chat or in the questions area and i'll try and answer those as we go through uh, i've also created a couple of polls just because i'm interested to see uh whether people have used uh Peta linux before or if they've um if they ha and if they have uh, whether they were using it on a zinc or a sort of a microblade sort of target so please take a look at uh, please take a look at that and go through. Uh, I've created a, I'm going to put a couple of links in the chat as well, just before we start to, before we go too further. Uh, and you'll find all of the slides. Uh, they are available at uh, this repo. Uh, and you might, if you're following along with me, then you might want to download some. I'm going to use the Ultra 96 as a target board because it's relatively uh, nice and straightforward and, and, and quite simple. Uh, so you might want some of the um, some of the build materials uh, from uh, from the link there that should open up into the uh, Avnet download have the excuse me into the Avnet download area uh, where you can uh, where you can take a look and you can download everything. So let's take a start. Let me share my screen. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to, hopefully you can see, uh, you can see my presentation now. Uh, so it's going to be quite a good chat. So over, over the, what we're going to do is what we're going to do is we're going to introduce Pedal Linux and a little, and a few of the concepts around working with embedded Linux and looking at embedded Linux. Uh, and then we're going to run through a couple of simple examples as to how to get the, uh, how to create a project, how to get it up and running. A couple of approaches that we can take to do this that we're going to, uh, that we're going to discuss. So we're going to take a little bit of a dive into some of the artifacts that are produced along the way uh, and that we might use on our projects to get us uh, to get us started and, and going and going with that. So I guess the first um, the first thing to say really is that uh, this is what we're going to take a look through. We're going to take a look through introduction. We're going to take a look at what the processing in AMD Xilinx devices are. Uh, then we're going to take a little bit of a look at what Pedal Linux is, the relationship to Yocto, which I think is very important. Device trees. I think device trees are something that we struggle with uh, quite often. So we're going to take a look at device trees and we're going to explain uh, a little bit about those device trees as well. And then we're going to take a look at the uh, the board support package, which if you're familiar with the uh, the Zinc environment and the, M or the MPSOC or the Vitus environment for the uh, for the bare metal approaches is, is, is slightly different, but it's a very powerful, very, uh, very important way uh, to, to work with these to work with these systems. And then we're going to take a look through a uh, a simple uh, a simple lab uh, where we're just going to create some applications. And I'm going to I'm going to show you uh, a few things that we can do with the Ultra 96 and with uh, and with Pedal Linux. Like I say, if we get as we go through, if you get any questions, then please just uh, please just shout out and uh, and let uh, let me know. So to get started, we've got to take a look at processing. So processing our FPGAs is, uh, you know, it's not new. We've had it for a long time. You know, I, I remember starting way back when, when I started back in uh, around 2000. And I remember in the early 2000s working with the, uh, the Vertex 2 Pros and the PowerPCs that, are, the PowerPCs that are in there. Of course, we've been on this journey for a long time now. You know, we've we moved on to the, uh, to the Zinc where we were essentially the the FPGA is uh, is an addition to the processor system. The processor system really is the really is the master and the and the control of it. And the, and the FPGA is the sort of the acceleration core. It's uh, it's how we have seen the Zinc. You know that's a phenomenal device. You know we can get that in single or dual cores. We have the uh, of course then that evolved into the uh, ultra scale Zinc. You know with the MP MPSOC with the uh, quad core A53s. And then in the last few years. We've begun to see uh, Versal as well with the dual with the dual core A72s. Now, one of these interesting things about this this journey is we've also, of course, had the uh, the microblade processor as well running through that and being available 
uh, while we while we start and work with it. Now, one of these key things, one of the key, the really key technologies about this is that to get the best out of many of these programs, you know, we can start writing. Maybe we do some simple tests in the at the bare metal level. Uh, you know, we do some. We, we do some initial hardware integration tests or some checking out of our IP tests using that, uh, using that bare metal approach. But pretty quickly, once we begin to move into wanting to do really complex real world applications where we want to handle networking, displays, file systems, as well as controlling the FPGA, you know, we end up needing a um, embedded operating system. And for the Zinc world and the, the Xilinx world, that becomes the, that for a lot of people becomes the pen Linux environment, which is uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So let's just take a quick look at the processes that we can put this onto. So we have um, one of the beautiful things about this is the flow I'm going to show you today. We can use this for, for literally any of these Xilinx processing devices from the seven series and up. So if you want to put it on the, the flow we're going to do, do today will work for the zinc. It will work for the Zinc MPSOC, it will work for the Versal devices, and it will work for the Microblaze device as well, which is really, uh, really important. And that's one of the real strengths, actually, of the AMD, uh, of the AMD programmable logic stable, really, is that the same tools, the same flow, you know, to do, even though you do using different processes, it's the same flow, the same tools, um, and it's a very, it's a very similar flow. Obviously, we've, we've slight tweaks to, uh, to get, to get it going, particularly, you know, the, uh, the microblaze has a few more has a few more tweaks than uh, than what you may uh, than what you may think because you need to configure it a little bit larger as well. With you know you need to give it timers, interrupt timers, uh, you know mm configure it to have the mmu in it and things like that. But at its heart, you know the the microblaze it's a soft core processor. It sits in our sits in our FPJ in our programmable logic, uh, and we can we can scale this from being a very small micro to being a very large microprocessor uh, that'll run a very capable microprocessor that will uh, that will run Linux for us. Uh, and we did we did previously maybe a couple of months ago we did one of our most popular webinars uh, that we've ever done on mastering microblaze and how to get microblaze up and running. So if you need to if you're thinking about using microblaze then please take a look at that and you'll be able to see uh, how you could create that micro that microblaze solution. When it comes to running Pedal Linux on here we can do that and we can do that quite easily. Uh, I'm not going to demonstrate it today, but literally every bit of the flow that we do from exporting with Vivado to creating the Petal Linux project to downloading and testing uh, is identical uh, for the for the microblaze, which is really one of the more important um, important things. What we you know, where we typically tend to run these processes, though, really where we typically tend to use an embedded operating system such as such as Linux is really in the hardcore SOC. So it's more more traditionally in the uh, in the ARM cores, in the A, in the A9s, in the A53s, and now in the A in the A72s. And that's because really these systems are designed not to run bare metal, but they're really designed. You know, they're application class processors. They're designed to be running some high level operating system, uh, such as embedded Linux. And it's one of the uh, one of the key elements that allows us to do that. To really scale and like i say do e do easy things such as interfacing file systems and such like so we have the zinc if you're not familiar with this you know this is a dual core or a single core cortex a9 uh, and we obviously have ddr we have a ddr interface as well in there to give us the ability to run the uh, to to run the applications from as well uh, standard interfacing you know we've got a lot of peripherals in there we've got usb gigabit ethernet ur i squared c can and of course configuration for for secure boot. So what's really exciting about this is when we start working with the with the pen Linux side of things, when we put that on there, it really opens up that that networking, that that U that USB connectivity. And as you move forward and you look at other uh, embedded Linux solutions that you could put on there, for example, Pink, uh, then it really begins to uh, to to open up. And maybe next, maybe we'll do another. Uh, maybe one of the first webinars we we'll do next year, we'll take a look at Pink if people uh, if people are interested. We also have, of course, we have the MPSOC, which is the, the bigger brother of the of the Zinc. Now, this gives us either quad core or dual core A53. So again, these are not 32-bit processors, but this time they're 64-bit processors, and they're really focused and powerful uh, for do for doing the uh, implementation, such as uh, 
embedded operating systems like like Petal Linux. We also have the Mali GPU in there as well, you know that, and that really to be able to leverage that, you know, we've really got to be running that high level, uh, that high level operating system to be able to get over and do it. We have, of course, we have the real time, we have the real time processor unit in there. Not something that we're going to run Linux on, but we might run the. Uh, we might run the real, real. Uh, we want a real-time RTOS on that, such as free RTOS or something, or something like that. It's really, uh, really flexible program um, and platform. And then finally, for the, you can tell I'm on a Linux machine, not a Windows machine, because I keep doing the scroll, not the, not the press down. And then finally, we've got the Versal devices, which have been released. You know, these are really like sort of, you know, these are the cutting edge of uh, all programmable devices. Uh, they provide us with dual core ARM Cortex A72s. Uh, they've also got the dual core ARM Cortex A5. So it's on, a, it's on these Cortex application classes that we're going to be running our pedal Linux, of course. They've got the network on chip, they've got which has got the DDR controllers, but it also gives us some determinism and, and guaranteed performance across the uh, across the, P, the PS and the and the PL. And we also come with, depending upon which one of the ranges you select from, you know, there's a range of integrated uh, integrated peripherals on there that give us 100 gigabit Ethernet, you know, the gigabit transceivers, high performance crypto engines, or we can also get integrated hardware where we could have the uh, AI engines, the DSP engines, or the uh, or the accelerator. Band. And these these systems are beginning to get more and more complex. So you saw the zinc was fairly was fairly straightforward. You know, the MPSOC is the next evolution of that, and then the next evolution of that is is versatile. So not only can we not only are these devices more capable, more powerful, but again we're creating more more complex solutions on them that, that, that you know really go beyond the simple hello world and, and elements that you can do with bare metal, hence why we need the uh, the operating system. And I just want to just want to touch a little bit on the processing capabilities. It, bl it blew my mind when I calculated this the other day. But you can just see sort of just how much of the single key that, that how how the steps the step change goes from the A9 uh, to the A53 and to the A72. Just what a single core. Uh, is capable of doing when you when you take a look at the uh, the dry stone uh, the dry stone MIPS there. So we always end up with a choice, you know, which one which one should we use? And I'm not going to dwell too much on uh, too much on this one. But when, whenever you're creating a solution, you know, we always end up the the debate of do we need do we need a hard processor? Do we need a zinc? Do we need a zinc a versal? Do we need a zinc MPSOC? Or, or can we do it in a microblaze? And here's a little uh, a little chart to help you work through uh, and customize it. But what we're really here for now, just giving a little bit of an introduction, just to make sure everybody's on the same page as the uh, with the with the zinc uh, and and the terminology, is what we're really here to do is talk about Pedal Linux. Now, Pedal Linux is something that's really been quite interesting to me, and and, and embedded Linux has been quite interesting to me in in general. It's something you know I'm a, I'm a traditional FPGA developer, uh, so as we've gone as we've gone through this journey, I've gone from having to learn about how to, you know, learning FPGA development to starting working with Zinks and learning about the, the PSPL co-design and, and brushing up my C skills to write embedded C and, and, and working out the bare metal to learning about how to use Petal Linux and device trees and kernel drivers and applications and file systems and, and all the things that I never thought as an FPGA engineer I'd, I'd, I'd end up knowing, uh, knowing quite a lot about. But it turns out actually it's, it's relatively straightforward uh, and, and relatively easy to get up and, and, and going. So really, let's just take a quick look. You know, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm sure we're all aware that, you know, Linux was created uh, as a free version of Unix uh, for the x86, x386 actually at the time, uh, by Linus Torvalds in 19, uh, 1991. And it was first ported, you know, it's got a long history of being on uh, ARM-based processors, even before ARM really became ARM, you know, it was first ported to one of the uh, ARM ACOM processors back in uh, back in 1994. Um, and the first embedded project, nobody's really sure, the first sort of embedded system that run, uh, that ran uh, an embedded Linux solution, but it's believed to have been some sort of x86 variant in, 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 the, in, the, mid to late, in the mid to late 90s. Now, where this comes in with our journey with our AMD uh, devices is that in 2012, uh, Xilinx uh, acquired an embedded logic, an embedded Linux company called Pedal Logic, uh, and they were offering uh, an embedded Linux tool, essentially, uh, for creating uh, embedded Linux solutions for Xilinx devices. Uh, and Pedal Linux was first released, therefore, in 
2013 to the public release. So it's adding very nicely with, you know, with the introduction of the zinc, with the, with the move from ISC to uh, to to Vivado. And what's really interesting is initially it didn't use Yocta, uh, but now since about since the 20 since the third release in 2016. Uh, it's been basically built around Yocta. So as you'll as you'll find out as we move on, what essentially what essentially Pedal Linux is is it's a it's a it's essentially a build tool that wraps around Yocta and creates as uh, creates as our embedded um, our embedded image. So I guess this is the first this is the first point as to you know what is uh, what is Pedal Linux, and it's actually you know it's not actually a, a distribution or anything like that. It's it's actually a set of tools that we can use. Uh, across a cross-platform development to actually create uh, an ARM, an ARM, uh, an embedded Linux solution for an ARM processor when we're running on a x86 Linux host, and it is at its fundamental level, it is actually very simple. We have just six Petal Linux commands. Uh, now there are many options to those Petal Linux commands, but there are actually only uh, there are actually only six Petal Linux commands. So there's the Petal Linux create, there is Petal Linux config, build, boot, package, and the utility. So the create command we will use, as you'll see as we go through it, you know, the create command is something we will use to create new projects, new applications, new BSPs, when I tell you what those are. The configuration is what we would use to configure the settings of the overall Petal Linux system. The settings of the kernel, the settings of the kernel, the settings of the root file system, uh, U-boot, and so on like that. So that allows us to configure our embedded Linux, uh, our embedded Linux solution. Uh, of course, build. You know that's fairly obvious what that does. You know that builds the entire Petal Linux, uh, Petal Linux uh, system for us and builds us the embedded Linux solution. That's the one thing I'm going to show you today, but I'm not actually going to click build because it's probably nobody wants to sit looking at a PC for 20 or 30 minutes while this uh, while something uh, while something while something builds through. But you can you can build, you know, you can build the complete design or you can just build the file system or the kernel um, or such like. The boot command is actually quite quite interesting because it will it will give us the ability to uh, and, I'll, and I'll demonstrate that later on. It's not part of the labs, but I will demonstrate that later on. But it will give us the ability to download over JTAG the FPGA configuration, so the so the bitstream, and it will also give us the ability to download the Linux kernel and get the and start booting and running with the Linux the Linux kernel. Now you can also do that if you want to. There's a Xilinx provide an emulator as well called Quemu, which is which stands for Quick Emulator, uh, and using that pedal Linux boot command, we can actually boot into a Quemu type environment and 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 we can use our we can use our x86 Linux machine to emulate the ARM uh, process the ARM processors and to execute and to and to load the applications and the operating systems that we've just and the files that we've just created as part of it. The package is used to help us create the boot the boot elements of the boot elements of the device. So we can we can create the boot.bin, but we can also create things such as BSPs. Uh, I've mentioned them a couple of times now. We'll, we will talk about them a little more, a little more uh, in a little time. But we can we can create those using the uh, using the Xilinx uh, Pedal Linux platform. And then the utility is just very. It's one of the least used commands. In fact, I'm I'm struggling to think of a time when I've actually used the Pedal Linux utility command. Uh, but it gives you the ability to do things sort of upgrade between projects. So if you created a project in 2020.1 uh, and you need to upgrade it to 2020.2, then the then the util uh, element will help you do that uh, also. Uh, so the build system is it's a build system. It's very simple. And unlike other embedded Linux solutions, where if you were just developing these for a, a processor, for example, where it's known what is what it's known what peripherals you might be using or it's easy to, easy to configure what peripherals might be using um, when we're developing for a, a programmable logic based solution we also have to consider that all of the all of the logic that goes into the pl we don't really you know that the operating system doesn't know about it and every time we every time we recreate the system or we rebuild the system you know every time we do that we might have different peripherals attached to it you know they're always going to be attached over axi but you know what we may have uh, you know we may have dma engines or we or we may have axi light things and so there's a range of uh, applications that we're going to uh, 
uh, that we might put on that we might put on there and and create um, and this is really quite this is really quite useful uh, because it gives us that ability to do it so what pedal linux does is it gives us the ability to take the hardware file that we've created so the xsa shell that we've created as you'll see and it will tailor that linux system for the configuration of our uh, of our of our design uh, and that includes the contents of the of the pl and we, we do this using a thing called device trees that we're going to talk about later but this this is really one of the powerful key powerful strengths that um that, that pedal linux provides us is that ability to do that uh, to do that configuration uh, of course, because it's a uh, now it's a, it uses the open source Yocto build system. So if you're familiar, if you're not like me and you're not an FPJ engineer that's had to learn embedded Linux, but you're coming the other way, you're an embedded Linux F engineer that has had to uh, learn FPGA, uh, then then the fact that it's wrapped around Yocto, you know, makes it very uh, very simple and very 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 easy to to get up and uh, to get up and going or or to get or to get to grips with any to get to grips with anyway. We also include, I was like I was just saying, we you know we also include that it also included is the Quemu, uh, the quick emulator, and that's really useful. You know, it's nice to see that things are booting and working on your system, uh, and particularly if you're doing sort of kernel or device driver. So if you're not operating in the user space but you're working in the kernel space, then Quemu can be very can, can be very useful uh, for doing for doing that kernel and device driver uh, development. So what does Pedal Linux come with and, and what do we get? So generally we get everything we need to create the embedded Linux solution. So we get the source code, the libraries, the applications, the Yocto recipes. And most of these actually are open source. There may be a few exceptions with, with hardware drivers that get pulled in from external repos. Uh, but most, most of this all is all is all open source. And as part of the build process, you know, if you're going through that open source process, as part of the build process, you can actually get it. it. It will actually report out all of the IP that's used, all of the libraries, all of the files that are used in there, and all of the uh, licenses. You know, the open source licenses that are used. So you can see that you can see there what's going off. So it gives us the ability to uh, build and manage the, the kernel source files and the libraries that we want to put into the kernel. And it also allows us to turn on and off the hardware drivers and modules that we want. So depending upon what we're deploying, where we're going then we may want a smaller or a larger uh, or a larger image for our uh, for our application so for example the ultra 96 which is sat here on my sat here on my desk i'm not going to move it because it's a little um it's it's wearing away and working but the ultra 96 that's sat here on my uh because he just sat on my on my desk there that's got wi-fi it's got you know uh it's got bluetooth so when you build the image system for that you know the first the kernel system for that you know you need to include additional packages additional additional root file things uh, an additional device tree to be able to get that to to configure and work so your lim your your linux application is slightly larger if you were for example developing for a a mini a mini z type application where you've got a small zinc where you've got a small zinc and small memories and you don't and you don't have anything then you might have a much small you might customize your kernel customize your root file system to be smaller so it fits in smaller memory so it's so it's at a lot so it gives you a lower cost on the bomb and that's that's really that's that's a nice thing about this is that we can we can include and scale up as we as we want what i tend to normally do as you'll see as we work through and, and get to this later on but what i tend to normally do is i tend to normally my first image is actually a very small image uh, and I and I create it such that the file system is a RAM based file system, so it's all included in the kernel. Uh, and I just want to check that the system boots, the system comes up, and that I can see all of the things that I that are all of the things that I think I can see. Uh, and then once I'm happy with that, I then go away and start working on and adding the additional uh, the additional drivers, the additional uh, you know, and, and moving across to a non volatile uh, RAM uh, file system on there. So it gives us all of the things that we need in our in our Xilinx world. So it, it allows us to configure the kernels, the kernel source and the libraries specifically for the for the processes that we're running on. It picks up all of the hardware drivers and the modules that are needed to work with the IP that we've put in the programmable logic, which is which is really important. But then of course the main benefit as well is it's embedded Linux. It's, so we can pick up all of the traditional Linux applications and utilities that we might want to add into 
uh, into our design. Uh, and beyond that, of course, you know, because we're using Yocto, if you want to go even, if you want to go even further, uh, then we can take additional, uh, then we can take, do, do additional things beyond what, uh, beyond what AMD Xilinx have. Uh, if you want to take a look at the, the link there, like I say, the files have all been shared uh, in the, uh, in the chat window. Uh, but if you want to take a look there, you can see a complete list of what's included uh, in the Pedal Linux window, uh, in the Pedal Linux window there. So what do we get with this? So when we think about our, our when we think about our, let's think about a Zinc or Zinc MPSOC type system for the moment. And when we want to boot one of these, you know, normally we need a first stage, we need a first stage bootloader, uh, normally to get that, to get it, to get the processor initially configured for what we want to do next with it. Uh, obviously the first stage bootloader for security reasons runs from the on-chip memory that's there in the, that's there in the device. And that on-chip memory is actually not large enough to, to host a full sort of boot system, a full bootloader that's going to load uh, something such as an embedded operating system uh, like, like in, like in better Linux. So the first stage bootloader, we'll get the first stage bootloader when we create our, when we create our Pedal Linux project, as you'll see in a little while, we get the first stage bootloader. We will also get any ARM trusted firmware that's needed. So any, any of the trust zone software that's needed to go, to go in there. But because of that first stage bootloader is relatively, is relatively limited in size, we also get a second stage bootloader called U-Boot. Now it's actually U-Boot that will actually go away and run and load in the applicate that will load in the uh, the kernel and start the uh, and start the application running, but all this is automatically generated for us when we just type in Peta Linux build. Uh, so somebody was asking me a question about the slides not moving. I'm on slide 15, so you should be able to see my mouse uh, moving uh, moving about. Uh, interesting. I don't know if anybody else sees that, but I see. Uh, yeah, so C15. So maybe maybe there's a little lag in your in your system there. Um, so it gives us all of that initial bootloader to get us up and uh, to get us up and running. If we've got the we've had Vivado hardware design, and I'm, I'm not going to, I've purposely not included much on Vivado in, in this one. We're good, we, we we might open it, we might not. Uh, but it takes that you know it takes that XSA from uh, from Vivado, uh, and it takes those takes and it. And it builds through, and it builds through all of the device drivers that are needed in Vivado to, sorry, needed by the IP that are in Vivado to work with to work with Pedal Linux. So it's going to give us all of the uh, all of those device drivers, and it's going to include that in the in the kernel for us. Um, and it's going to obviously it's going to import the design into it as well. So it's going to create as it's going to take the bit file and pull that into the Pedal Linux build build attributes that are going to get, get going to get provided to you, because it's going to give you the um, a boot.bin file that's got the first stage bootloader, you know, it's got the trusted firmware, the FSBL, and it has the uh, has the bit uh, has the bit in there as well to, to program it up. So it's it's going to give you everything that we uh, that we need. So if we're using later than 20, um, 2018.3, and today we're going to be using twenty twenty two dot one. Uh, with a slight modification for the uh, for the demo on the uh, Ultra 96 because uh, that actually the latest build that's been released for that 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 seems stable is 2020 dot uh, dot one, uh, but it it works you know it gives us a Linux kernel version uh, for four point fourteen and the great thing about it is obviously is this because we've got these multi processors you know in the Zinc we've got two processors. In the MPSOC, we've got four quad cores. In in the Versal, we've got two. This is this is doing some you know this is doing symmetric multiprocessing. So it's balancing. It's using all of the processors to give us all of the to give us the processing that we want, and it's control and it, you know it's automatic. We don't have to worry about it. You know the operating systems uh, doing that. If we want to, you know we can when we configure the system. Uh, we can configure it to use fewer processors, maybe only one processor. If we wanted to do a system such as uh, open AMP, you know, that would be a, that would be a way forward and we could, uh, and we could, and we could do that and then just configure a, a, so many processes to run the, to run the Linux application and another one to, a, for example, a, a, a bare metal or a free RTOS application. Now we do, you know, we do get a lot of information for this and it is, it is quite a detailed, uh, a detailed solution. So if you want to really learn about it all you know user guide 1144 really is the sort of the master 
uh, the master reference for anything that we're doing with uh, with Ped Linux. So whenever you start doing this, if, if you open that link there, if you download the slides that I've put on the on the GitHub, download those, download those slides, open that link there. And that's really going to really be quite useful to you, not only to help you get the tools installed and get up and running and make sure you've got all the prerequisites, but actually get you running through uh, and making sure that you have everything you need uh, and you can work with all the commands to, to get up and going on that. So Pedal Linux forms part of uh, part of this ecosystem that we're that we're talking about, uh, and actually, you know, we've got the SDSOC on there, but that should be Vitus. Uh, but Vitus, you know, it replaces Vitus. It, it works with Vitus with Bravado, uh, and it gives us a nice, complete debugging uh, debugging environment. Um, so it's an interesting element, you know, that that comes along, and we and we get, you know, so we get a lot of. Uh, we get a lot of implementation and a lot of uh, a lot of source sources. So, for example, so where everything comes from in our Pedal Linux distribution, you know, we get the uh, we get the U boot, the kernel image, and the Zen hypervisors. If you're using it, we get that from kernel.org, plus the AMD Xilinx patches, like you would expect, you know. And to do that, to test that and prove that, you know, Xilinx AMD, uh, they do test on reference designs and on their silicon to make sure that it's uh, that it's good. And it gives you a host of documentation with it. The file system comes from, you know, the, generally the, the Yocto community base. Uh, and that's also tested with the Xilinx uh, software and, and features. And then the bug, you know, the bug, the bug fixes are fixed in the next next Yocto release. Because, because, both are, because both are open source, uh based you know there's a, there's a lot of support a lot of information available out there in the community uh that can help you create your first embedded linux uh, solution and get working with it so like i say today we're going to be working with the ultra 96 it's going to be my it's going to be my target board of choice just because it gives me a few examples and there's, there's a few build artifacts that we can use to identify what's what's going on but like i say whatever board you've got you can uh, you can try this and, and work with this on, uh, but obviously at the bottom of the stack here we've got the uh, we've got the programmable logic, which is going to contain our programmable logic design uh, in a very basic base design for the Ultra 96. You know, that's going to contain the input, the ability to talk to the Wi-Fi and to the Bluetooth chip. Um, it's going to contain. It's going to have the obviously it's got the ARM Cortex A53s, the GPUs, the RPUs as we were as we were talking about, and then sat on top of that, you know, the, the Pedal Linux solution is going to give us the first stage bootloader, the trusted firmware, the U boot solution, and then finally the Linux solution that's running uh, that's running on top of there also. So it's quite a comprehensive process that we go through to get this up and to get this up and running. Uh, so you know, if we start with stage zero from from power on on our on our uh, on our MPSOC, you know, we're going to get the boot ROMs running, and that's going to detect the boot mode. So in this case, it's going to be the SD card boot mode, uh, and then it's going to load in the first stage. It's going to load in the first stage bootloader, which is uh, then once the first stage bootloader is going to start executing it's going to initialize the processor as we've defined in our in our hardware project in Vivado. it's going to it's going to configure the clock in the um it's going to configure the peripherals it's going to configure the ddr it's going to configure the standard in standard out it's going to it's just going to basically set up that processor for us to do further further work with once we've got that it's going to then execute the second stage bootloader uh, and that's going to essentially that bootloader is going to load the kernel. So that's going to take the that bootloader is what's going to load the kernel. It's going to pass the boot arguments, and it's also going to pass the device tree. Now I've mentioned the device tree a few times, and we're going to talk about that in a little while. But the device tree is what configures the uh, what 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 tells the kernel what peripherals it has connected to it. So without having to recompile the kernel every time, the device tree, you can modify the device tree and say, we provided the drivers installed and say, we have a, a UR or we have a SPI or we have I2C or we have Ethernet or USB. That device tree, as we'll see in a little while, is what gives us that com gives us that configuration. Once UBoot is doing this, it's you know it's loading. It's going to then pass off to the to the Linux kernel, and that Linux kernel. It's going to initialize all the system hardware that it's been told about by the device tree. So it's going to go away. It's going to see all the peripherals that the device tree said there are. It's going to find the addresses that they're at. It's going to go away and get the drivers. It's going to come back. It's going to bind those drivers 
initialize the hardware, and then it's going to mount the root file system. Now, in many cases, that root file system is also going to be on the SD card on another partition. Uh, if it's a non-volatile um, root file system, if it's if it's a RAM-based root file system, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna put it in the uh, in the RAM, obviously. And then once the file system's mounted, it's gonna go through its initialization, the login prompt. And then the startup scripts are going. The startup scripts are going to run to bring up the uh, to bring up the to bring up the system. And then it's at that point that we can really log in and see what's um, see what's going on. So Pen Linux is great because, as I said earlier, on, one of the things about it is it gives us this multitasking. It gives us this multitasking capability because we can do we don't we can we can you know it's all it's all interrupt driven it's gonna it's doing symmetric multiprocessing so it's loading tasks onto processes and stopping them starting them as as needed um and it, it gives us the best utilization of those four cores without us having to directly as as engineers get in there uh get in there and manage it so it gives us a really nice sort of uh near real-time uh, operating performance on the on the on the zinc uh, it's fast because obviously we've got 464 because nice it, obviously it's nowhere near as fast as the programmable logic but it's still it's still fast it's still quite responsive you can you can drive a desktop out of it if you want to you know a light a lightweight desktop uh and and that will that will work it's fine but it's not a, obviously it's not an art it's not a real-time operating system if you need a real-time operating system then we need to look at what's there in the r5 cores and we uh, and we need to put them in there but that brings us back to an interesting point because one of the things that we need to do with these systems such as Pedal Linux when we've got the APU running running an embedded Linux solution, we've got the R5 over here running something, we've got another processor that we created in the microblaze in the in the programmable logic. And we want all these to be able to communicate, to be able to communicate and pass messages together. And into processor communications, actually, at times it can be quite challenging because maybe you want you want to send messages between each other you maybe you want these processes want to share system resources you know so maybe the maybe the um apu and the rpu they want to both drive the same gpio or the same uart at some point in time depending upon what your depending upon what your system is or maybe maybe microblaze maybe microblaze does uh, so within these you know within these multi-processor systems uh it can be quite challenging you know we can use mutexes and and spin locks and things like that. Um, but one of the best ways to do the communication between these different types of processes is to use a framework called OpenAMP, uh, which stands for Open Asymmetric Multiprocessing. So asymmetric multiprocessing is when you have different types of operating system in there. So Linux, you know, the Linux that are running on the um, on the four quad cores, that's a symmetric multiprocessing because all of the quad core, all of the cores are running the same operating system. Uh, but what if you cut if you run between the a53 and the r5 where one's running linux and one's running um real real artos for example uh, that's asymmetric because they're both running different operating systems but open amp gives you the ability to communicate between uh between those different it's a it's an open source framework uh, and it gives you the ability to communicate between those two pro, two cores and to send messages and actually you can you can the application processor is the is the master of it all so you can actually start and stop and do full life cycle management as well and again if we want to do that we can configure that in our peta linux uh in our pedal linux solution um like i said one little one you know it's not a it's not a pure artos so just be very careful what you do with it if you want to do anything with it but with system with careful thought and, and design you know you can actually get quite quite good performance quite good performance out of it so we've talked a little bit about the processes that we have in our in our system we've talked a little bit about the history and and, and kind of what pedal linux is and, and where it comes from and what's it go uh, and we've kind and we've talked a little bit about just previously like the boot flow and how it gets up and running on our on our processor but but there's a whole other step before it gets running on our processors to how we create and how we how we do this so before we can even get to the point where we can take an sd card and we can plug it into our device we need to go back and we need to work and create the uh, create the basics here so the first thing is like everything in this it starts well we're going to start we can start in one of two places we can start with what's called a board support package 
Now, a board support package for Pedal Linux contains a sort of a reference hardware design, and we'll take a look at this in a minute, but it takes a reference hardware design. It contains all of the configurations for a project, all of the device tree settings for the project, and it's really intended that you can, once you've gone through the pain of bringing up and configuring a Pedal Linux project, you can create a, a board support package for that particular board, and every time that you then create a new project, you use that BSP and it will be configured in the same way. So you've got all the same interfaces and everything and everything works. But initially, initially on any board, you have to go, you, and if you're particularly if you're creating custom boards, you have to go from that initial design. And and this is what I'm showing on this slide here, where we, we start with a Peta Linux, sorry, we start with a Vivado design, where in Vivado, we open our Vivado application, we open Vivado, we put in our Zinc or our Zinc MPSOC or our Versal or our Microblaze, and we configure it how we want. So we configure the clocking, the DDR memory, the peripherals that we want. Do we want one UART, two UARTs, two SPI, one SPI, you know, an I squared C, gigabit Ethernet, USB, you know, what do we put in the programmable logic for the for the bare design, you know, what, what's needed there? And we create that design in design in Bravado. Once we've done that, we can take that XSA from Vivado uh, that we've created. So we can export the XSA from Vivado. And it's, you can do that, of course, you can do that pre-build and, and, and post bitstream. Uh, but once we've got that, we take that, we take that, that Vivado um, XSA and we create a new Pedal Linux project. So we create a Pedal Linux project and we tell, we use the Pedal Linux create command and we tell it that we're going to create a new project and we give it a template device. Uh, the, the template processor. So we say we want to target a Zinc, a Zinc MPSOC, a Versal, or a Microblaze, and that will configure the pro that will configure a generic project for that particular device you've selected, be it a Zinc, a Zinc MPSOC, or a, a Versal or a Microblaze. Once that project's created, the next step is to uh, take the XSA that we previously. Uh, exported from Vivado and configure the newly created Petal Linux project with that XSA. So we run the, the Petal Linux configuration command, we tell it where the hardware, we tell it where the hardware file is, uh, the XSA definitions, we tell it where that is, and it will then configure the newly created Petal Linux project, it will go away, it will create it. So then it will automatically look at what what things we have in the PL, what things we have in the PS in the configuration, and it will ensure that the, the relevant drivers for that are included within the kernel. It will create the device tree that includes all of those and does all the necessary bindings and everything. Uh, and then it will give us uh, the basic configuration of the project for our, for our target application. Uh, there might be cases where, and we'll talk about it in a, in a couple of slides time, there might be cases then where we want to do some additional configuration. So we might want to include additional um, additional packages, additional applications, or things like that. Or we might want to update the, the device tree uh, to include things that Vivado doesn't know about. So for example, if you're working with a USB uh, FI or an Ethernet FI, it, because that's outside of the scope of Vivado, it doesn't know what it is. So manually, we need to edit the device trees to, to, put, that, to put that in there. But we can, uh, we can, we can do that, and we'll we'll talk about that in a little while. But once you've done that configuration, you know, the next stage then is to build it. And once we build it, you know, it goes away and it builds the kernel, the root file system. It takes a, depending upon the power of your machine, it takes a uh, takes a little while, of course. Once that's been built, you know, we can we can do the package option uh, if we want to. So we can create the, those boot files, those those boot file. Uh, references to allow us to get started. Or we can, if we want to, if we've finally gone through the iterations and we've configured the board just right, you know, we've got our device trees just right, we've got all the all the basic packages we want, all the basic applications that we want, and we're kind of happy with it, then we can create a BSP at that point in time, and we can give that BSP to other developers on our team to use as their base starting point when they work with, uh, when they work with this board, which should be really, uh, really exciting. And then, of course, we want to boot the device as well. You know, it's uh, it's only when we put the put the thing onto hardware uh, that we see the final um, uh, that we see the final 
that we see the final that we see the final system uh, and we can we can we can boot it we can we can boot it there and we can do that into boot it into quemu uh, or we can download the image onto the uh, onto this onto the target device that we're working that we're that we're working with and it's actually a very simple flow you know you can you can go from pedal linux to i would say you can go from pedal linux to sorry from vivado to a pedal linux build kind of up and running depending upon the, the speed of your machine easily within within an hour within an hour or two and get something uh to get something up and running if you've not seen it if you've not seen it before one thing uh just before as just as i'm going through somebody was asking um a question in there about logging into the sharepoint it is an open forum SharePoint. It is a, it is a SharePoint that's linked to from the uh, Abnet Element 14. Uh, I think you might have to register for an email. You might have to register for that. Uh, or you might have to just go in via the, you might have to just Google. I'll, I'll find the Element 14 links in a little bit and put them in there just so you can do it. There was somebody else just asking, is it a, a BSP or an SD, a BSP we create on SDK? It's really a BSP because it's just allowing us to config. It just configures the project essentially uh, for it configures the project for for the board that we're that we're working with. You know, for, for software development, uh, we still really work with the the Vitus environment and and such like. But we'll take a look because the BSPs can be quite. The BSPs are actually quite useful, uh, and you can put quite a bit of information. In. So we'll we'll sh we'll take a look at um, what's in the. Um, Avnet Ultra 96 BSP in a minute. I, I spent a little bit of time before this meeting uh, just doing a little bit of unzipping and, and exploring so I can I can share I can share with you. One thing I will mention actually just before we move on is I set a couple of polls up on the polls tab. So I don't know if there's a couple of polls there. If you want to take a look and uh, and try and answer them, that would be great. Uh, just just to give me some understanding of uh, of what people are doing and what people are what people are using. So like I said, Pedal Linux, it uses six commands. So let's take a look now at the six commands in a little bit of depth as to uh, as to what they are. And we have that first one, the Pedal Linux create. And I've mentioned already this before, you know, it allows us to create the project. And that's the most important, that's the most important one, right? We want to we want to create a project. It allows us to create an application. So if we once we've created a project, we might want to create some C applications or something that we embed into our pedal and its projects and embed them into the boot into the file system such that they uh, such that they come up with us so we can create that pedal linux uh, we can create that pedal linux project there we can create the applications maybe we need to create some libraries or we want to create some kernel modules there uh, and that will give us the ability to to do it so it's a relatively straightforward thing to do we just create the uh, create the <coughs> excuse me exactly what we want and then we can uh, when well, we can go from it if we want to do the configuration you know to come to configure the configure the project just so so we can use the pedal linux config and that allows us to configure the hardware location so that's where the uh, the vitus the vitus export is the the xsa export and that allows us to then configure that project for as we were just talking about but we can also do that to configure the kernel the root file system uh the and and u-boot and such like or the actual system or the actual system settings itself and we'll we'll take a look through that um in a in a moment obviously the build sort of things we can build for the uh we can build for the product we can build the project it'll take a, it'll take a little while to build the project if you start building the project or we can uh or we can build the uh just an element of it such as the root file system or a specific or a specific application uh, if we if we wanted to so i mentioned earlier on that we have yocto uh in here and this is really important for people that are kind of familiar with embedded linux development and it's really important for us to understand how, a little bit shall we say about what yocto is where it comes from and then what we can what we can do what we can do what we can do with it because the projects are very configurable in pedal linux you know we can make changes we can change the device trees we can do things like that but one of the key things that we uh that we that we need to do is we need to make sure we change the right area because if we change the wrong area in the project it'll get overwritten when we build it and our changes will make no no impact and we'll be sat there going mm, i thought i'd change that uh, and then a few hours later you'll realize you change you change the wrong area after you've 
uh, spent a little time uh, wasted. So Yop2, you know, it's an open source collaboration. You know, pretty much all of the big companies contribute and work with it. And it stemmed from the fact that literally everybody, everybody was doing their own, that was doing their own thing in terms of building embedded Linux projects. You know, they got their own build flow, their own tools, uh, and it was causing, it, causing I was, chaos is probably a, a, not the great word, but you know, if a developer moved from one company to the next, you know, there was a lot long time of upscaling and getting them to use their flow. And it's not the most efficient, uh, efficient use, you know, people want to be, you want people to be focused on doing the value added activities, not just the, not just the basic activities. So that's, that's kind of where the Yocto, uh, Yocto came from. Again, like Pedal Linux, you know, Yocto is a framework, not a distribution. Uh, and while we're not going to do it in this, we're not going to do it in this class. If anybody's interested, put a thing in the chat, and I'll and I'll write a blog or do a tutorial on how to do an how to do an actual build just using Yocto and not not going anywhere near Pedal Linux. I think I have some labs that I've taught on that over the years, uh, so we could we could we could I, I'd be quite happy to pop that up and, and share that. Uh, but it, like I say, like Pedal Linux, it's a framework and. Uh, it allows us to build, you know, it allows people to build their own distributions. Uh, and of course, it contains um, contains a lot of reference distributions as well. Uh, and like I said, literally just about everybody uh, uses Yocto in the embedded Linux, uh, in the embedded Linux world. And since 2018.3, uh, um, basically Pedal Linux puts a wrapper around Yocto, shall we say. And, and abstracts away the commands and details that you might use for exactly for things like Bitbake, which is how you build the, uh, which is how you do a pedal Linux build. Or sorry, how you do a Yocto build using using Bitbake and Bitbake recipes. We'll we'll look at that in a little while. Um, that's how um, that's how sort of pedal Linux works. It does that it does that wrapping around it. So I guess why Yocto, you know, it, it because it came about because it was increasingly popular. You know, Linux was increasingly popular for embedded systems. You know, there were many distributions. You know, the developers, like I was saying, there was lots of time making porting and build systems, uh, and that's interesting. You know, the most dangerous word in engineering is it's interesting uh, because it always it always tends to cost money when an engineer tells you it's an in, it's interesting. Uh, but that left that that obviously there's only a finite pot of money. Uh, and that means that, you know, there was less money then therefore to spend on developing software features and frameworks and such like. So it's better, you know, to have a uh, sort of a Yocto, uh, a build from uh, a basic build system that everybody can work with uh, and everybody can um, and everybody can sort of focus on and use because it's a portable. It's even for the developers, you know, it's a portable scale. It's you don't have to keep on learning it. You know, you can you don't have to keep on learning new systems. You know, you can you can you can really get to grips with it. Um, and, and work and work through it and that's a little bit about you know the benefits of um of yop of yocto and where where it came from um one of the key things about yocto though is it has these layers uh, and you'll see them called you know they generally you'll see them called metal meta layers in there and you can see this diagram on the uh on the right there you know you've got the you've got the very lowest level sort of um um core there you've then got the yocto layer you've got the board support package layers to configure it you've got then optional layers uh, optional layers going off it and and the layers are all named something so you'll have like the meta yocto layer you'll see a you'll see a meta xilinx layer for example a meta a meta xilinx tools layer for, ex, for example and these are important to understand what these these layers are because as the layers go up this go up the stack for example you can you can set commands in in a higher layer that will override commands in a lower layer to configure the uh to allow you to configure the system uh and get it uh, and get it going so somebody just asked a really interesting question about why do uh why do people use um yocto instead of pedal linux and i and and that's a really interesting question i would say the answer is because they're engineers uh, and because sometimes engineers like to do things slightly slightly differently than, than what is the standard way. Um, actually, in all, I'm joking really, but in a lot of cases where I've seen people use Yocto, uh, they've, what they've really wanted to do is they've wanted to have, um, like in FPGA design, you want to have as, as generic a RTL as possible, such that it's 
as maximum portability as possible. Uh, and they wanted to do that. They wanted to do a similar thing with their embedded Linux solution, uh, because depending upon the size of the application, depending upon the depending upon the, the the size of the application, i.e., how you know how big the market attraction was, they they were considering doing a doing an ASIC after they'd done their PGA. So they wanted so the few use cases I've seen, they wanted to keep it in sort of the Yocto the Yocto world as much as possible, uh, such that it would uh, it would be. Uh, as independent and, and, and a little bit more portable. So we go down, we have these layers, you say, you know, and these layers are great, you know, they allow us to apply patches to, to the kernel. You know, we can use them to copy files from either locally held or, 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 on, or on Git repo somewhere into the root file system. Uh, we can use them to build user applications and, and such like. Uh, and we can also uh, add them in for, you know, adding new kernel drivers and such like. Now, one of the uh, one of the key things, obviously, in Pedal Linux is we abstract this away with the, uh, you know, all the Yocto commands are really abstracted away with the um, Pedal Linux build commands or the configuration commands. But importantly, like I said, we need to understand where we fit in the system and, and what layer we can we can change. And the layer we can change will be is what's named as the meta user layer. Now we can add in other layers if we want to. We can create other layers and add them in. That, that, that's easy enough to do. That's easy enough to do. We can do that quite easily. Uh, but if we want to, if we need to change anything, it's that meta user layer that we have to find. And you'll find that in the. I'll show you the project directory structure in a minute. But when you see, you'll see the project name essentially, and then you'll see a directory called project specification. And then there will be a meta user. Um, a meta user library, a meta user layer, and it's in that layer that you make any changes. Because if you change something else in one of the other layers, say you go into the, uh, the meta hardware layer or something like that and change the device tree, it's automatically generated in that layer. So the next time you do a build, your changes will be automatically generated and it'll be overwritten. Uh, so it's only that meta user layer, unless you create other layers that will see it being, um, being worked with. So we can do this. We can, like I say, within the within the Yocto, you know, it's, it's really quite powerful. So we can we can go and get source files as well. Uh, so we can call out the locations of these source files if we want to get them and build them. Uh, so we can get them from remote, i.e., the internet, you know, so from GitHub's and such like, or we can build them into our own uh, into our own uh, from our local library, and it can get sources from Git's, you know, SVNs uh, and such like as well. So it's really quite. Uh, really quite powerful. Uh, and like I said, Pedal Linux, it's really kind of, you know, it's it's integrated now with that Yocto, uh, Yocto build system. Uh, and it gives us the ability to go away and to to, to create the uh, create the solution. It allows you to leverage not only your in-house expertise, but also the Yocto community software support as well. And it generates everything we need. It, from the beginning to the end, it generates the entirety uh, of the system, and if you do it, uh, you know when you do when you go in by when well when you're going by Yocto or by Pedal Linux, it's going to pull down all of the um, all of the things from the AMD Xilinx Git repo. So it's going to get the trusted firmware, the U root, the kernel, the root file system. You know, all that's going to come uh, from those remote from those remote locations and be compiled into the operating system files that we need. So if you want to take a look, you can you can you can go take a look. At the uh, at the Yocto recipes that uh, AMD Xilinx have, and you can go take a look at the uh, the third party uh, layers as uh, layers as well, and you can go see what layers they've got and and take and take a, and take a look. Um, you know, it's it's really configurable, it's really flexible, and you can you can have a lot of great you can have a lot of great fun you can have a lot of great fun with this. So when it comes to this, what we're going to do is we're going to create, uh, we install Pedal Linux on our on our Linux machine. Uh, and when we install it, we'll see this framework across the top. So in green, so you'll see the Pedal Linux area, you'll see the tools, the components, the ETC, the apps, the MISC, and the Yocto, uh, and the Yocto elements of it. The more interesting element to us is what we see under the projects area. So you'll see it will create a, we'll create a project here called my project. And then under that project, you'll see a number of directories created. So you'll see the components element created. You'll see the images. Uh, the images is obviously where the final image is, is generated. Uh, you'll see the build element, which is where all the builds, where all the build resources go. And you'll see the project specification. 
under the project specification, you'll see the configuration files, you'll see the hardware description, you'll see the meta Peta Linux generated layer. So that's a meta layer that Peta Linux has generated. And you'll see the meta user layer. So it's this meta user layer that, that we can change and we can, we can work with. And under there, you'll see the configuration, the application. So if you want to create applications, we create them under recipes applications. If you want to create BSP stuff, we create it under recipe BSP. If you want to create device trees or modify the device tree, it comes under the uh, recipe uh, recipe device trees. And again, we can have we can add in recipes for whatever else uh, whatever else we would like. Uh, so it's really uh, it's really it's really nice. It's really simple. Uh, and once you get your head around it, it takes a takes a few minutes to. And I'll and I'll stop showing you death by PowerPoint in a little while. But it's important to understand all this stuff. And we'll we'll delve into a project and looking at a project hierarchy uh, going off. And, we'll, and I'll show you a couple of ways that we can uh, we can do we can do that project. So we've got like I say, we've got the app to BSP. You know, if we've got Wi-Fi networking, you know. So, Wi-Fi or networking, you know that might be under the connectivity recipes. If we've got core things, if we've got if we've got kernel patches, etc., you know, they might be under the recipe kernel. Uh, if we've got modules, device drivers, they're going to be under the recipe uh, recipes modules. And multimedia, you know, they might be under the multimedia example. So here's a here's a simple example uh, for the um, for the mini Z showing the different different layers of what's under the under the applications, the recipes, the connectivity for the um, for the Wi-Fi uh, and, and any kernel and such like and any modules that are that are included. So Yocto, like I say, Yocto is great. And if you want to take a more of a look at it and learn more about it, then uh, take a look at those links um, and references there. And um, as a couple of you have asked in the chat, I will uh, I will create a blog over the next couple of weeks uh, about how to do it from um, how to do Yocto uh, from scratch on a um, um you without without pedal linux so one of the things that we need to think about and we've talked about it a little a little bit and i've mentioned it several times is unlike many traditional socks and, and actually traditional socks have this challenge as well because they've got fixed they while they've got fixed io and fixed peripherals you know they've normally got more peripherals than can be rooted out to every io so they also need configuration uh, to show what is configured at what point in time uh, or for that particular application uh, and the way there are ways you can do that, you know, and if you think about the Zincs and the Zinc MPSOCs and Versal, you know, we've got large address maps, we've got large memory spaces, we've got interrupts that change, we've got we've got AXI networks that change, peripherals that change, and all that needs to be told to the embedded Linux solution, so as it can actually bind the appropriate drivers, it knows where the physical addresses are, it knows what the physical interrupt numbers are, and it can it can work as a work as a system. Um, and that's a bit of a challenge, really. So I guess I guess you could go with an approach like you see in the bare metal in the bare metal element, where you create like an x parameters .h file and you list everything in there. The downside is this time it's going to be quite a large file, uh, and it and every time you change the slightest little thing or you change the slightest little uh, element of it, everything would need recompiling. So you'd have to do the entire recompilation to include the to include slight to include slight changes, which again is not very efficient to our, as, our, as, as FPGA engineers, you know, it's not what we, um, it's not what we want to, uh, what to, want to do. Uh, the best approach was actually another industry approach where, where we created what's called a device tree. Now a device tree is a textual description of what is connected to the, to the processor. Uh, and the CPU is the is the root node. The brushes are, are branches on it, and the devices, such as you know, the devices are are, are nodes on it. Uh, and each node has has some properties, you know. So it has an address range. It has device properties. For example, what driver to bind to, or, or what clock it what clock it's clocked from, if that's important to be needed what interrupt connection it uses what interrupt number it uses uh, and if you and, and it, it can get quite it can actually get quite comprehensive so there's a there's all this is provided in the device tree what this means is that the device tree if you remember back a few slides the device tree is handed to the kernel 
by U-Boot, by the U-Boot. So what happens is you take the this textual device tree, and I'll, I'll show you one in a, in a minute. You take this textual device tree, you compile it using a device tree compiler to create what's called a device tree blob. Once you've got that device tree blob as with, with U-Boot, your U-Boot your passes that device tree blob to the kernel. As, and as the kernel starting up, it interprets that device, it uses that device tree blob to work out what's connected to the processor, to work out what drivers it needs to go and connect, what it needs to what it needs to pull through, what it needs to find from, uh, what interrupts are used, what address space is used, so as the system, so as the processor can come up and bring up its system, and it can use those uh, it can use those interrupts and those 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 peripherals that are connected to the uh, to the to the um, to the processor. Of course, if you make any changes to the device tree, say for example, uh, you decide oh you make a mistake, you say oh no this is so you know silly me it's not um, it's not this particular driver that i want it bound to i want it bound to this driver you can just change the device tree recompile the device tree which takes literally less than a second and and, and then the next time you, you reboot your system it will be picked up it will run through and the new device tree will be there uh, so you don't have to go through that kernel compilation all the time it's really good it's really uh, it's really powerful uh, and it works it works exceptionally exceptionally well so as I was saying, we have the uh, device tree. We'll get that as what we call a device tree source. Uh, so that's just a textual description. It's just you can read it in a text file. It's in a standard ASCII file. You can you can do that. We get the device tree blob, which is the compiled representation of the uh, device tree source. Uh, and then we have the device tree compiler, which is provided by uh, Peta Linux. Uh, and that will do that, that that compilation. What's really cool as well, actually, is if you've got a device tree blob, you can go backwards from that and you can decompile the device tree blob back to uh, back to device tree back to device tree source. Uh, so as you can uh, take a look at the um, so as you can take a look at what's actually what's going off um, what's going off in there uh, and see and see what see what you've got see what you've got configured. So if you take a look at a simple uh, simple device tree structure here, you can uh, you can see this. Like I said, it's provided to the kernel at boot time. And what you can see here is, for example, we have the SD card up. The, we have the SD card at, at the top. What's most interesting is the AXI here. So we have the AXI AXI zero interface, uh, and the device tree here is actually telling it. And, and this is in the this is a programmable logic AXI, not a PS um, AXI. Uh, and you'll see here it's telling it what driver it is compatible with. So it's compatible with the Xilinx XPS IIC driver here, which is really, which is really cool. But then you can also, because you can know that you, because you know the system and what it's connected to on the board, if you want to, uh, you can also then run through and connect in uh, the next, you know, you can then connect in downstream things. So for example, the Linux kernel can talk to a, uh, an LIS to DS12 STM device. So, and the, and the and the driver's there. So if you update the kernel to say, you know, at this uh, at this address on I2C channel five, it's obviously connected to an I2C switch in this instance, on I2C switch channel five, at this address, you find this compatible, you find this, you'll find this compatible device and it can load the drivers for that. And then your software application can pick it up and work with it quite easily and quite quickly. So you're benefiting, uh, it's, it's another benefit of the Linux really and the embedded Linux solution is not only do you get all this, do you get everything, a lot of things like in, in to, you know, like networking and file management systems for free, but you also get to leverage the whole world of sort of connectivity and drivers that exist. So now you don't have to write a driver for this anymore. All you've got to do is just interact with that driver to get it to tell you, to get it to provide the information that you, uh, that you want from your application so it, it accelerates your it accelerates your development time uh, and down the bottom here as well we can see a similar thing with the uh with the s with the spi as with the spi as well which is which is really quite important um so like i say we generate we generate this all automatically and you'll be able to find these i'm going to show you these in a minute you'll be able to find these all over the place so you'll find you'll find the generated device tree source under this path here, so under the Pedal Linux workspace device tree generation. Don't change it because it's auto-generated. Uh, but if you need to make any user editable user changes, any user edits, 
you can find this under the under the device tree source under the device tree source here uh, and you can make you can make changes there so you can overwrite default parameters uh, and you can make any changes there so that's that's where to make those uh, where to make those changes but the one thing and and the other um the other picture demonstrated quite well you know the demonstration of the um of the device tree was was quite important but there's a key point i want to make here about these device trees and when we export our XSA and when we configure the Pedal Linux project, it's only aware of what exists within our Zinc system or our Zinc MPS, MPS, MPS OC system. So it's only aware of how we've configured the processing system, what we've put in the programmable logic. It's not aware of those system level interfaces that might be sat on the outside, like if I go back a slide or two, like this. STM device or an Ethernet file or a uh, US or a USB uh, file. In which case, you need to add that. You need to add those into the um, into the uh, user space, into the user device tree, to show that that is uh, to show that that's what you want to happen and for it to bind and to and to pick up. So it's just a it's just a point of warning, just to make sure. Because when I first started this, I was like, well, I've enabled the USB, so why doesn't it pick up the USB in the device? Why doesn't it work with my USB device? It's half, because I've not told the device tree that sitting external to the to the device is a is a USB file, and I need to tell it which type of file it is so that it can connect and work and work with it. We'll take a look at that in a minute in a minute too. So when you take a look, for example, at the uh, at the Ultra ninety six uh, device tree. In the user space, that, that user that, that user device tree under the meta user layer, you, we ha you find we have to add information about the I2C switch. We have to add information about the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, and the US the USB free host as well, and a few other things to get it all uh, to get it all set up and running. And that's one of the beautiful things about board support packages is once you've been through this and you've done it and you've got it all set up and you've got it all working, uh, then you can create a board support package. And the next time people come to use it, come to work with it they've got the um you know they have a uh, nice and simple way to do it and they don't have to go through the pain of setting it of, of setting it up so there is this the role of the bsp we've talked about it a few times you know obviously every time we're going to start if you're doing a custom board you're going to start from scratch you're going to start from that bravado xsa export and doing the configuration setting the device trees up and getting it to a stage where you're happy you can uh, you can create a you can create a bsp uh, but you want to do that if you're developing pedal linux solutions for your boards for your custom boards or you've taken a dev board and you've created a sort of a, a really cool application of it and you've configured your you know you've configured your uh, pedal linux solution in certain ways then it's a great idea to write out and package the bsp out of it because that means next time you want to create a project that's like that that does the same thing you use the bsp as the reference so as opposed to referencing the hardware you when you create the project you reference the bsp and it configures the project exactly like you want to do uh, with that with that BSP. And it's a single, you know, it's a single it's a single line to uh, to to do to do it. If you take a look in the you know if you take a look in the, at that Ultra ninety six example that we we're just talking about uh, with the BS with the BSP and the and the and the uh, device tree files. I just couldn't think of the word then. If you take a look at the device tree files. What you'll see there is you'll see all of the uh, all of those device tree files set up exactly as you want to get it working for the Ultra 90, to get it working for the Ultra 96. Which reminds me, actually, there was a question, somebody just asked me a question about how would they uh, configure, you know, how would they configure this uh, custom, uh, a custom pedal Linux project uh, for a, um, an a, a, a Nexus A7 board? In that case, obviously, because the Nexus A7 doesn't have a zinc um, or it doesn't have a hard core on it, you're going to be creating it with a microblaze, so you would create a microblaze uh, that is able to um, to run Linux, and then you would go, for, you would export the XSA, you would pull it into Pedal Linux, you would create your Pedal Linux project, and then you would uh, apply, then you would build your Pedal Linux project. Bear in mind, it's a microblaze solution, so you're you're not going to be adding in. A, creating a huge embedded Linux solution, you know, you're going to be very on the scale of where you are in that embedded Linux solution. You're going to be very much down at the minimalist end of the pedal Linux solution that, you, that you've done it. But I mean, certainly, if you take a look, I can. If you take a look at my blogs um, at Aduvo, there is a uh, there is a series. I don't do it on the Nexus A7, 
but I do it on the RTA7 board. And I did a series of blogs about how to create embedded Linux solutions uh, for the um, for the microblaze, so as you could actually run through and do it for the uh, and do it for the and do it for the microblaze. It's all it's all it's all in there, and hopefully that'll uh, that'll keep you going. Um, and get you going obviously once we've got our system up and running we've we've created and we've built our system if we're curious about what's in there then we can take a look and we can we can uh, take a look at the device tree live on the uh, live on the arm live on the arm processor as it's running uh, and we can see what's uh, we can see what's going off there so as we can see that and we can check that it's got the uh, got the device tree in there Um, okay, there's, there's, there's an interesting question, which I'll come back to in a second. I've just seen that pop up. So uh, the key concept, of, co of course, obviously with this is the memory is the memory management is the MMU, you know, and that creates in, in, in an embedded Linux solution. We work with a virtual address, not the uh, not the not the physical, not the physical address. And it, because that means that um, the memory management unit can make sure that everything's safe, everything's secure, nothing's going to sort of trash and, and conflict with each other. Uh, and therefore, each program thinks it is the only program in the in the CP in the CPU. Uh, now we're coming back to the question that somebody was just asking. You know, there's a range of ways that you can interface with your own um, with your own uh, with with IP from from Pedalytics. You know, one of the one of the simplest ways is well, actually, this is not interfacing with IP in the PL. This is interfacing with things like SPI on the out on the outside world. One of the simplest ways is to use the uh, if you're using I squared C, is if you want to interface with I squared C sensors, is to use uh, the uh, I2C dev option. Uh, that that should be enabled by default in the in the kernel. Uh, similarly, uh, we can also add in new elements and new uh, new new functions to that. Uh, and one of those we could add in, for example, for the LSM60 SL sensor, would be the would be support for SPI. Uh, so we can add in, I think I'll put it down here in a second, maybe not actually, uh, but I'll oh, cut it out. Uh, but I'll, I'll send stuff, but we can add in the, um, we can add in the SPI elements of it as well. If you're doing a, uh, want to interface with your own hardware, then you can use the uh, SysFS uh, uh, type, type approach to it. Or if you really want, if you're really feeling brave, uh, you can, you can actually use, uh, you can actually, bypass the MMU and go straight to the hardware address if you if you wanted to in the um, in the um, in the hardware uh, that you know from Vivado and, and do it I can I can show you so I can link some blogs at the end of this once I've finished at the end of this and I'm taking more wide, wider questions I can talk a little bit I'll link you to some examples uh, examples for that So, like I say, if we want to add anything, you know, it's not unusual that we want to add in our own system at the end of it. We want to add in our own custom uh, application that's going to run. So we can we can create that again using the using the pedal Linux using the pedal Linux command. That's going to tell you how to create an application, how to create the template, how to and how to do it. Once it does that, not only is it going to give you that C plus plus sort of file where you can write your C plus plus, it's also going to give you all the bit baked recipes and everything that are needed by Pedal Linux to actually compile that, build it, and integrate it within the file system should you want to as an, as an application. Uh, and how it does that, it's going to give you a thing called, you, we use a thing called BitBake to, to build it under the under the hood. So you can see here that the Pedal Linux command translates to the BitBake, Pedal Linux, user image. Um, and when we do the BitBake, it runs the, what are called the BitBake recipe. So you'll see me seeing the recipes apps recipes pl recipes dt and such like uh, and that's that's what really uh, the recipe gives the information about how to how to create that package what its dependencies are where its source code resides whether the source code needs any patches and then how to compile it and then once you've done all that compilation and everything where to actually put it on the final on the final machine uh, and in this case you know a simple uh, a simple example, a simple bit bake recipe. You know, is showing the uh, the location of the of the C file that we want to compile, uh, the make file that defines how to you know how to compile that 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 C file, uh, the recipe instructions for where it's to be located once it's once it's done, and then where to install this in the um, in the in the file system at the end of the 
of the day. Oh, now where are we? Now we've talked a lot about sort of what pedal in it, what, what processing is, what pedal Linux came from, what Yocto came from, the various elements of Petal Linux and, 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 what, and what remains. So let's take a little bit of a look now. The Ultra 96 is still up. Let's take a little bit of a look actually now as um, at what is in some of these attributes that I asked you to download earlier on. And then we'll take a look at creating and, um, and modifying a, um, a file. So I have under here, Pedal Linux Projects, Pedal Linux Web, oh, that was at this level. So earlier on, we, we talked about downloading the the BSP from the Avnet from the Avnet website, uh, and this is the BSP that can be downloaded from the uh, from the Avnet website, um, which is here. Uh, and I extracted that, so it's a BSP, and it it it, it it's just a zip file. So if you rename it uh, tar dot tar dot gz, you can you can open it, you can extract it, you can you can do what you want with it. Uh, but if we look underneath this, what we'll see is we'll see the elements of the project and the elements of the Pedal Linux project, if you remember back to the slides I showed. So you will see the, the components elements, so the Pedal Linux workspace. We'll see the hardware. So under this, as part of this, they've actually included uh, the Vivado design. So you can see here, the Vivado project has actually been included in the Petal Linux BSP. Now this is really important because if you want to modify the hardware design that the BSP is based on, you might want to start from working on that Xylit, from, from working on the, the Vivado project that, that it all came from to, to make your modifications to. So when you create the BSP, it, whenever possible, if you can include the hardware, then that's, then that's fantastic because it gives, it, it gives everything in a nice, uh, in a nice tight package, you know, that, that can be easily shared uh, and easily used. We'll see the pre-built elements. You know, this is where we will see the images for the uh, for the pre-built images. And you can see all the different types of image artifacts that have been created there. So you can see the uh, the trust zone code. You can see the boot up bin. You see the actual kernel image itself, the root file, the root file systems, the the U boots and such like. So it's really so all those all those boot artifacts are there. Uh, and you can see then the project specification layer as well. And you'll see here that you've got the configuration, the hardware description. So Avnet have declared for the Ultra 96, Avnet have declared their own meta Avnet layer. Uh, and under the meta Avnet layer, of course, they've got a lot of recipes for doing for doing what they for doing what they need. And then there's, of course, there's the standard sort of uh, BSP user area um, for 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 doing uh, for doing for doing this. Uh, and for making any modifications, so this is a this is where the uh, system user file is that we might edit. Actually, it's not that one; it's that one. Uh, and you can see that in this one, there's no edits to be made because they're in the Meta Avnet layer. So, so you can see the you can see the um, See the quite comprehensive, uh, or it's actually quite difficult to see, but you can see the user uh, device tree there that's been created uh, to get all the Ultra 96 with its I.O., with its peripherals and everything up and, up and running. Now, this is one of the benefits of the BSP because obviously you wouldn't want to be entering one of these every time, uh, every time you every time you started uh, working with a with a board and going from uh, from scratch. So let's take a look at creating a simple, uh, let's take a look at creating a simple project. And I, we can do this one of uh, one of two ways. I'm going to minimize, I do want to minimize, I'm just to move it onto a different screen. I'll pop that over there. And one of the first, one of the things we can do is we can create an application. We can go through and we can create an application and see what see what's doing. Now, in the time to save, you know, essentially to save time. Um, in the best Blue Peter tradition, for those that are in the in, that are in the UK, I've created design in I've created a design in Vivado for the Ultra uh, for the Ultra ninety six as it stands, and then we can uh, take a we can we can take a look at it. So. 
under this project, let's take a look where we are. So under here, I've created, an, I've created a project in Vivado, a very, very simple project. It's the most simple project you would ever do. It's literally just configured the processor system on the Ultra 96 for the Ultra 96 board, then generated and the design exported. So what we can do, we can use this as a target application and we can come in here uh, and we can create a new Petal Linux, uh, a new Petal Linux project for this, where typing, typing on screen live is just going to prove how appalling my typing is. Let's try and make it a little bit bigger so as we can see what's, uh, see what's going off there. But so let's do uh, Petal Linux. Dash create. So we're going to create a new uh, a new application. And we're going to do dash t. And we're going to tell it it's a project that we're creating, uh, and then we're going to do what's the next command? Actually, we could create. We'll create the project against the Ultra ninety six BSP. So I'll grab the Ultra ninety six BSP, which is this one here, and I'll just under there uh, so we'll create it against that against that project template in fact uh, which will be a little faster uh, so u96 uh, bsp2 and i guess we hit enter at that point and you'll see now that it starts creating a project hopefully up here you'll see it creating a um You'll see create a new project directory, and then we'll take a look through that. Then we'll take a look through that project directory and that project directory structure. While we're waiting on this, if there's any questions or comments, please feel free to throw them in the uh, in the chat or in the in the questions area. Uh, hopefully, that's running through. Always takes a lot longer, I've noticed, when it's actually on the. Um, when you're actually doing a project live, it always takes a lot longer to run through and get something up and running than it does if you're just sat uh, sat on yourself, just uh, just waiting. So let's take a look now uh, at the chat, at the, at the projects. So it's quite interesting to look at the poll results to see that, that about sort of 70% of you have used sort of Pedal Linux before. What I should have asked is, uh, I'll ask this in a poll, how, e how easy did you find using Pedal? How easy did you find using uh, using Petal Linux? Difficult. So the new poll there, if you want to take a look at that and see if anybody's got any thoughts on how they found uh, Pedal Linux to be able to uh, able to able to use it, uh, I found it to be really straightforward. To be honest, apart from some of the uh, some of the key things that we have um, have in there, that's really taking its time to create the project. So now we see it's run through, uh, and using this BSP, it's created it's created a project now that we can uh, that we can take a, that we can use. Uh, to build our our system out. So we might want to do some configuration of this. So if we want to do some configuration, we can do pedalinux.config. Dash C, let's take a look at the kernel. Why is that not liking that? What am I doing wrong? Oh, inside the project. Helps, doesn't it? If you want to do, take a look at the um, want to take a look at the project, you know, and take a look at the configuration of the overall system, uh, then we can just use the pedal Linux config uh, config command, and that will run through, uh, and it will show us it will open us this configuration uh, screen, and in here we can work through, and we could take a look at things such as the uh, this, the 
uh, processor selection, the uh, you know the memory location. If you take a look at the serial settings, you know this is this is always an important one to remember to make sure, if you, particularly if both UARTs are used, to make sure that we've got the right standard in, standard out, uh, and to make sure that the that the uh, the board rate is set uh, is set correctly. I want to take a look at the Ethernet settings, although obviously the Ultra 96 doesn't have any um, any Ethernets on there. Uh, we might want to take a look at the flash settings if we have the flash or the uh, or the SD card settings. In this case, obviously we're working with an SD card where it's going to boot from. Uh, we might want to take a look at the FSBL configuration or the FPJ manager to include the FPJ manager to allow us to do uh, to do elements with it. I want to take a look at the image packing you know how are we what are we doing you know where we're we going to put our root file system so this assumes that the root file system by default is on a um is on an sd card or is on a x is on an ext formatted part partition if we wanted to you know if we wanted to use a a, a ram file system you know where it's a non-volatile uh rams ram system uh, and it changes you know we might want to select one of the init rams or jfsd you know we can we can change all of these all of these elements to configure the configure the system so for example if you're using a microblaze system you might want to use a ram based file system compared to a uh, an external uh, system i did change i didn't mean to change that um then you've got the you know we can take a look at what we want to call the host name the product name um, and and so on uh, and it's a, and we've got some implementation, you know, for 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 Yocto settings as well that we can uh, that we can change if we want to add user layers, you know, into the into the project. We can uh, we can do using using that system there. This allows us to pick up and take a look at the uh, at the at the solution um, and see what's going off. Um, in there and then this is the overall this is the overall system for example so this is the overall uh, pedal linux system that we've got uh, now i don't want to say reset so that one uh, what we might want to do is we might want to take a look at what's in the root file system for example so let's take a look at the config c root fs so this is our file system so we might want to configure the file system that gets generated and booted in so we can let's take a look at the standard sort of thing. So do we want to have, uh, you know, the the standard admin things? Do we want to? What do we want to do in terms of audio, base marking, benchmarking, even? Uh, you know, what what do we want to do for the ker for the kernel? Uh, what do we want to do for for, for networking and oh, the W? The, what do we want to do for the WPA supplicant if we're using if we're using Wi-Fi, for example? Uh, what about power management and any you know any utilities and such like that we might that we might have? We might want to add in you know specific pedal Linux package groups you know so um, I'm sure many of you have seen some of the projects and the blogs I've done for example you know over the years, but we can take a, you, you might want to take a look. We might want to include the Open AMP that we've got, the Open CV. We might want to use if you want to create a graphical user interface, a GUI interface. We might want to use Q, We might want to use Qt. Uh, we might want to enable Qt, or we might want to take a look at the video for Linux, and or the or the GStream, I think with GStream, if we're, for example, if we're doing image, if we're doing image processing, and these are, you know, adding these in is very cool. It's very, but but when, as we're adding these in, our file system is going sort of bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, we might want to take a look at what sort of um, images images we have in there. We might want to, if we've created any user applications. So if we've created our own user application from a BitBake application or something, then we might we would see this here. So you know the peak and poke example and the GPIO demo is included uh, included here. Uh, and then we might want to see any settings and any users that we can add for the uh, for the extra extra users and what we want to what groups we want those to be uh, to be added to be added to. And all this is going to get created when it gets built and it's going to get added into the. Uh, added into the file system and there's quite a lot of uh, things that can be uh, that can be added and built similarly we might want to do the same for the kernel 
Um, and the kernel is where, whereas the root file system is going to give us like the applications that we might want to use, uh, the additional things that be in the file system. The kernel is where we might want to make modifications and configurations uh, to things such as the device drivers that we're, the device drivers that we're using, uh, or, or, or making sure that certain things are enabled. So, for example, we recently did a did a project with the KR two hundred and sixty on on a robot on a on a Turtlebot robot. It used Pedal Linux and the and the KR stack. Um, but the default image for that didn't the default Pedal Linux for that image didn't support uh, USB modem type operation. So we had to open the kernel, we had to recustomize the kernel to enable the device drivers to provide the um, to provide the, um, the the USB modem type uh, capabilities for for uh, for that. It's a good job this machine is quite quick, so hopefully it will open very quickly and we'll be able to see. This is one of the things with the sort of pedal Linux; it's very command line uh, command line based. And takes a little while to run. So I'm not going to. I'm going to show you how to do this once you've done this and you've configured it. You know, I mean, we're in a state now that we could type in pedal Linux build, wait an hour, or, well, maybe half an hour to an hour, and we would have the images that we could use uh, on uh, on pe on our pedal Linux solution uh, to and download it onto our uh, our device. I did type pedal Linux kernel, didn't I? In this one, I didn't type boot, uh, but this should run through and this should grab everything we. Uh, we need to allow us, allow us to open and configure uh, the kernel. This, this, this is the reason I did it second. This is the reason I did it last uh, was because I knew the kernel took a little while to uh, to open. So hopefully not uh, not too long. Uh, come on, so it'll get there. So once we've done this, we, we like I said, we're in a position that we could click on click on build if we if we could type in pedal Linux build if we wanted to build, and it would do the. Uh, it would do the it would do the build for us uh, and and create us a Petal Linux uh, Petal Linux solution. While that builds, actually, one of the things that we could take while that while that opens, one of the things that we could take a look at very quickly because time's ticking on, uh, is how we debug the system. So debugging is slightly different because if you're used to the bare metal approach where you click in where you know where you use the J type to debug. On Pedal Linux, it's different because we've got a Linux operating system that, that's running on our on our target. And while it's running on our target, we don't want to, we can't connect to it over JTAG and things like that. So we have to connect to a TCF agent, a debug agent that's already running in the on the Linux core. So down here on my desk, I mentioned I had a Ultra 96, uh, and it's all plugged in and it's all it's all up and running. It's got the latest Avnet. Uh, image in it, the latest have their out of box image in it, um, and you can you can see we can we can talk to it, and it's the it's echoing the uh, echoing the commands there. One of the things that we want to do is we want to be able to debug. So if we if we want to debug applications and test them on there, we can use Vitus obviously. Uh, now Vitus is quite nice and simple to get up and uh, to get up and running. Uh, and I'm gonna, we're going to step through creating a new application uh, project to do this. Uh, I'm going to show you how to do that. And now what I did is I downloaded the Ultra 96 platform from um, from the Avnet from the Avnet um, from the Avnet SharePoint, and I added this as a added this as a added this as a repository. You don't have to do that if you want to. You could bring it in and you could. Because we're not doing any acceleration flow, you could bring in the XSA file that you you could bring in the XSA file that you wanted, uh, uh, that you exported from your project and, and created from an XSA file. Uh, I'm just going to run it from the Ultra 96. There, we'll put in, we'll give it a name, test live, um, and you can see here it's picking it up to run on the uh, A53 cores in a symmetric multiprocessing approach, like we were like we were talking about. Uh, We've got all that information. That's all good. We'll click on next. It's going to find us some templates. Hopefully, it's going to find us a hello world template because that's nice and simple. We could do if we wanted to. We could take a look at the app, the, the the system, the the software acceleration templates. And if anybody's interested in a in like next year doing a doing a webinar on that, then we'll 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 take a look at that. Just pop something in the in the chat if that interests you. But for the moment, I'm just going to run a simple Hello World application. 
which is going to be the simplest application ever going. Uh, the source file here, it's just going to say hello world. Uh, if we click on build the hammer there, is this still, that's still downloading. Uh, you'll see it took about 227 uh, milliseconds to build, didn't take very long to build at all. Now I'm just going to move my camera very slightly so if you can see, where's my, let me find my Ultra 96 and if I can lift it up. Very cautiously lifted it up. You can see my Ultra 96, maybe just, uh, it's actually got a USB dongle attached to the front. So as my, the office has got a captive ethernet so it can't capture Wi-Fi, so it can't catch it over Wi-Fi. Uh, but it has a, it has that Wi-Fi um, has the um, has the Ethernet port fit there, and this is important because when we do the debugging of a Linux application, this is one of the re reasons I wanted to show you this just just to, just to wrap this up. Uh, we actually have to use the Ethernet, you know, to, to connect to it and do it. So if I do if config in on the on the um, on the Ultra ninety six. What we should see is we should see an, e an Ethernet address here, 172.16.102.55. So that's the uh, that's what I've been allocated as the address in my uh, in my office. Now, if we want to run this, we can uh, run this on the uh, on the debug. I don't know if we've got a debug configuration. I want to open a debug configuration and create a new uh, single application. Um, I'm going to call it here. I'm going to call it the, it's connecting to a, a live debugger here. So you can see it's connecting to a Linux live. And earlier on when I tested this just before I created a new connection. So by default, you will see this Linux agent. Uh, but if you want to connect to the Linux agent, because it's on a remote machine, you really need to connect new and give it a target name. So we'll call this Ultra 96 uh, Live. We'll set that as the default target. And I'm going to type in here that IP address, so 172.16.102.55. Uh, and I'm going to test connection. Brilliant, it comes up. I've got a connection on this. Um, and then we've just got a simple thing. Our application is going to get downloaded to this location. I actually want to download this to the uh, home route where I'm logged in. Uh, and I want that to be on home. Well, uh, and then if I hit apply to that and then debug, billion dollar question. Why is it stopped there? Shouldn't have stopped there. Never do live demos. What have I broken? Let's just disconnect it all again and try it. Terminate and remove. Terminate and remove. Deep. Hello world. So this time you see it works. It pops up. It shows us the hello world. Uh, hello world item. What's really cool is if I go across here to my to my uh, open up the serial terminal again and do ls, you'll see now that we have a application called test live uh, dot l under there as well. Um, and if we run this. Uh, if we run this, we can run this simply. I'm just going to hit run, you know. Uh, you'll see this in the terminal, in the terminal debug window, uh, in the terminal debug window here. Uh, and then if we do, um, we can we can still see it. So it should, it should, it's all there and it's all nice and running. And it just shows how we can nicely debug our applications and connect to uh, and debug it. In the meantime, our kernel thing is still downloading and downloading and downloading. Uh, so if anybody's got any questions, because we've got about 15 minutes left, so hopefully um, hopefully this will complete before the end, uh, then we can take a uh, we can take a look and try and answer any questions that you've uh, any questions that you've got. Feel free to just pop them in the chat. I'm just gonna take a quick swig because I've been uh, talking for rather a long time now. And so I'm beginning to think of, well, as well, so there's a question for the audience, you know, I'm beginning to think of what webinars and workshops I'd like to put on next year. Uh, so if you've got any ideas that you'd like to see, then uh, please throw them in the chat and I'll, I'll do my best to think about how to, uh, how to create something around them. Obviously, this one will be uh, made available for replay uh, later on this evening via, via the same link that you've got or via the, um, or via the, or via the website.
Um, so I'm just going to grab that. I can't work out how to uh, grab the whole screen. I'm just going to take a screenshot of the poll results before the end of <laughs> before the end of this, and I, before before I forget because I've never worked out how to actually get them after the session once the session has ended. So that's an interesting question. So somebody said, can I briefly talk about Pedal Linux um, development with a, under a Windows Vitus tool? And to be honest, you you have to really develop, uh, you have to really develop the kernel, the Pedal Linux kernel. You have to develop it on a on a window on a on a Linux machine. Now, what I what I what I've got obviously I'm in the office, so I've got a you know I've got a fairly beefy Linux machine sat next to me with an Alveo card in and things like that. Uh, but what I generally do, because I normally use a lot of, I, I normally have a laptop and I'm on the go quite a lot. So what I normally do, and I don't, uh, I think it got knocked off in the in the transition in in setting this up for today. But what I normally do on my Windows machine, I normally create a virtual machine, uh, then I put Ubuntu on it, and I normally I have this thing that I put them on solid state uh, external USB C SSD drives that I can just plug into my uh, computer because that way it doesn't eat up the hard disk on my on my machine and I can I can take it about so that way you can use the virtual machine to create the pedal Linux solution and go through all the steps that we've gone through today of course if you just want to use uh Vitus you know if you just want to create software applications in in Vitus and connect to the connect to the Linux target then you can do that from a Linux machine from sorry from a Windows machine but you can't, um, but you can't do the accelerated flow, of course. Now, somebody's just put an interesting comment in there about using uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever tried that or ever seen anybody do that to actually get something uh, up and going. But if anybody has put a put a comment in there, maybe 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 it'll make something for me to uh, be interested in and go away and take a look at at, uh, at creating a blog um, about it. But just coming back to now, just wrapping up. So this kernel configuration, you know, so we have this, uh, we get this configuration window here to allow us to configure the, uh, to allow us to configure the kernel. And you can see it's actually, you know, it's quite comprehensive. We can go through and we can configure all elements of the, of the kernel that we might like. We can go through and the most importantly, you know, we can sort out what sort of device drivers we might um, uh, want as what sort of device drivers we might want. So we can go through, there's a whole range of them. Uh, and because this obviously is a wide range in the Linux solution, you know, and it's an open source Linux solution, there's a lot of things that you can use, a lot of things that you uh, that you can't use. But for example, you know, we can take a look at uh, USB support, you know, and, and USB Fi or USB on the go. We can look at specific, uh, specific devices, um, specific storage and, and, and mass storage, for example. We can take a look at the user space I.O. drivers, which can be used uh, for the um, for driving the uh, for driving and configuring things in the in the PL. So we can take a look at there's a whole host of things actually that you can take a look at. We could you could be here all day taking a look at it. But you know if you've got industrial I.O. support, for example, so the industrial I.O. support in here will allow you to access the XADC. Uh, and read the XADC values from uh, from Pedal Linux. Uh, we could take a look at uh, oh, there's a range of uh, a range of things down here, but we can take a look at all of those sort of elements. You know, the FPGA configuration. You know, how how it wants to be, uh, how we want to do it. Whether we're using uh, Zinc or Versal. Uh, we can take a look obviously at the file at the file systems that we use at the memory management options as to how we configure the memory management options uh we can take a look at you know the the kernel hacking if you want to uh, if you want to allow that uh all the general you know all the general setup of the um, of the of the platform uh, and where everything uh, where everything comes from it really gives us quite a uh, quite a powerful um thing to go through and uh, and work with you know we can configure all of our uh, networking options here as well so our, our wireless options this is obviously configured for the ultra 96 which has got a uh, uh, got a wireless chip on it uh, 
But yeah, so that that's a really good way of being able to do the uh, to do the configuration. So Christian's just asked a really good question about how to do configuration and version control. Um, and yes, that's a good that's a good question. I think that's a little bit more than what I than than the sort of the time I've got enabled uh, for the at the moment. But but what I will say, Christian, actually is. I think that's such a good thing that I'll put it on my list and I'll write a blog about it in the next week or two as to how to as to how to do it. Because obviously configuration control and putting things into co under configuration control is always uh, is always vitally important. You know, obviously the uh, the zinc um, the zinc obviously the BSP. You know that can be that can be quite useful, but but you actually there are there are key files that you want to configure control uh, particularly you know things like user device trees and things like that configuration files and and everything so i'll, I'll create something um around that it might might take me a few weeks i've got a few other things in the pipeline but it, it's definitely on the list because i think it will be uh will be quite quite important david's just thank greatly answered about how xilinx to use um dfx as well in there for doing for doing dfx designs which i think is um is really sort of flexible and important and if you've not come across dfx before you know i've got a few tutorials on the website that will show you how to uh show you how to do how to do that uh, okay let's take a look what else have we got in the questions so somebody was asking once pedal linux is built can we log into pedal linux can we see an address map of our bravado project uh, you can't quite see. You can see the address map, but not the not the address map fully. You can see, um, and let's see if we can do it live here for the last minute or so. Uh, you can see if I pull this up. If I go up a slide or two here, uh, you can see the device tree. So let's do this live on the Ultra ninety six. It's been running all afternoon, so it's bound to be a little. Uh, bound to be a little slow now uh, but let's take a look at proc let's see the proc device tree cd proc yeah let's do this If we take a look at the device tree and then we can do ls dash l oh, not lsl oh, ls dash l uh, and you can see you can see what elements are added into the um you can see some elements of into the device tree there uh, and if you do you can do uh, hex dumps uh let's do the one of the what have we got here We've got an I squared C thing in there. We've, we've got the II, we've got the I, the IO monitor and such like. But you could do uh, you could do hex you can do a uh, a hex dump of the uh, of the device tree element, and it will tell you the um, it will tell you the um, so what it'll tell you it'll tell you the address trees and everything. I think we have to look at the amber PL uh, the amber PL, and then that will show us what we've um, what we've got on there. But that's a nice simple sort of uh, flexible way to flexible way to do it okay we're nearly at about the time i'm surprised it's taking two hours i thought i was sat this afternoon i was thinking yeah, it's not going to take that long when we start talking about this but there's always a lot to uh, a lot to talk about so i hope it's been uh, i hope it's been really useful to you all as you've as you've worked on this and taken a look at it uh, and if you've got any please if you've got any questions you know then just let me know uh, put it in there, drop it in my email address, you know, it's quite a, um, message me on LinkedIn or, 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 or anything like that if you've got any questions, uh, and we can, and we can try and take it from there and get you, uh, get you up and going. But yeah, let's have a, oh, look how we get emojis as well. But yeah, if you've got any other thoughts about any other workshops that you'd like uh, for 20, 2023, I can't believe 2022 is nearly over, uh, then just give us a shout and we'll uh, we'll take a look and try and think uh, about what we can uh, what we can do.
Ah, workshop for Vitus Unified Platform. Okay, we'll put that on the list of uh, we'll put that on the list of things to uh, to do for to do for next year. Right, I'll I'll leave you all there. I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, so, like I say, I'll I'll end the event. It'll be available for on-demand playback, and obviously all the slides and everything. Uh, I'll create a little thing on my website as well, so it's got a link to the video and links to all the materials that are that are involved as well later on this evening. Um, if you want to, if you want to watch and replay it. But again, thank you very much for attending. I hope it's been useful, and I will speak to you all later. Bye bye.